us to the rest of the news. This week, the United Nations is hosting a major conference on happiness. That's right, with the world obsessed with wealth, austerity, and debt to GDP levels, the United Nations is taking a step back to figure out what makes people in some nations way happier than people in other nations. The conference is ho hosted by the King of Bhutan, a small country in the Himalayan Mountains. Bhutan is one of the poorest nations in the world, yet it's the happiest nation in the world, and one of the happiest in the world. And so what does Bhutan know that the rest of us don't? Well, that's what the United Nations wants to find out. On last night's show, we talked a little bit about this topic by dissecting the nation of Denmark, which routinely tops the list of happiest nations on the planet. Take a look. So here we have Denmark, a nation that taxes at higher rates than we do in the United States, gives basic health care and free education to all its citizens, hasn't sold their elections off to the highest bidder, doesn't place any importance on arming their citizens against each other, isn't involved in any wars abroad, and has 72% of its workers unionized. Hearing those stats, Republicans' heads would explode. Yet Denmark is the happiest nation on the planet. We're the nation that wrote the right to pursue happiness into our first founding document, our Declaration of Independence. Maybe we should take our own advice and learn a few things from Denmark. So what else can we learn about how to be a happier nation? Joining us now from New York to offer some answers is Helen Norberg-Hodge, Norberg uh, producer and co-director of the film of The Economics of Happiness and founder and director of the International Society for Ecology and Culture. Helena, my apologies for mis mispronouncing your name. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Very glad to be here. I understand you're in New York attending this UN Assembly on Happiness by the invite of the Prime Minister of Bhutan? That's right. Am I pronouncing the country right? And how did this come about? Uh, how did the invite come about or, yes. the, or the meeting? Well, both, the actually. Invite is, I, I, well, I've worked in Bhutan, so I've, I've known the Prime Minister for actually for a long, long time. I worked mm. there in the 80s. And I've been working in Ladakh, which is a very similar region, up on the Tibetan Plateau for 35 years. And I've been promoting the shift to a new economic paradigm with a major focus on happiness for many years. Mm -hmm. And this film that we've made, The Economics of Happiness, is very closely aligned to what the government of Bhutan is trying to do. Ah, and so what is the secret behind Bhutan? Why are they so happy? Well, I would say because they've maintained at a fundamental level, I think it's because they've maintained community structures so that people feel a sense of identity and belonging through more face-to-face -face living relationships. They have also maintained a situation where basically there's no unemployment, so there isn't a competition for scarce jobs. The gap between rich and poor is relatively small. There is one, but the very richest and the very poorest see each other and can talk to each other. So it's a lot to do with the scale of the economy. A lot of it is to do with both financial and, and, and psychological security. And I shouldn't say financial, I should say economic, because a lot of the Bhutanese are farmers, so they're more dependent on a direct relationship to the natural world. They're not so indebted to banks as we are. Yeah. So the United States is by far the wealthiest nation on the planet, but not the happiest. So is there any correlation between wealth and happiness? No, I mean, there are certain statistics that will show, obviously, if you are in an impoverished situation, you know, in the slums of Calcutta or slums of New York, for that matter, that material well-being is important. But on a national level, I don't think we see any correlation. But there is obviously a need for having a certain basic needs met. But once those are satisfied, it's very clear that a sense of belonging, a sense of connection to other human beings and to the natural world, a lot of our research shows that these connections are fundamental to our well-being. Hmm. In, uh, tell us about gross national happiness, GNH. Well, GNH was actually something that the King of Bhutan came up with many years ago when the World Bank came to Bhutan. This is about 25 years ago. And the King said, well, actually, we're more interested in gross national happiness than we are in gross national product. 
that idea caught on with a number of economists and people like me around the world about five, six years ago. And there's now been a sort of global movement working with the government of Bhutan to raise awareness about these issues. What we're talking about is a fundamental shift in economic thinking. It needs to have a deeper and broader understanding. Uh, so then, once we look in a more broad and deep way around the world, what we see is that we've allowed a sort of empire of corporations and banks to run the world. Mm. They are pushing every government in the direction of abandoning allegiance to their local people, to their local businesses, to their local economies in the favor, in favor of this speculative um, casino where, as we can see, very few people get super rich and the majority is marginalized. You were talking about Denmark earlier. I'm from Sweden originally. And I ha I'm sad to report that even in the Scandinavian governments, this pressure from this empire, as I think we need to see it, this global empire of corporations and banks are pushing governments there too in the wrong direction. The good news about this is that we actually do have a global majority of people who would really have a lot to gain by insisting on shifting the economic paradigm. One of the things we're seeing is that in order for that to happen, we can't rely on economists. We need to rely on people, on writers, anthropologists, farmers, all of us, rethinking what's really important to us. Yeah, brilliantly said. Helena Norberg-Hodge, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you.